Welcome back to this uplifting, exciting session broadcasted live from Lovington SDA Church. And our theme has been the embrace or forgiveness and reconciliation. And we've got a very interesting topic today. The title of the topic is Rebuilding Walls. Rebuilding Walls. Maybe before we proceed, I would like us to pause for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that we can hear your word. I ask now, Lord, that you will direct us in this session and build up the walls in our lives that have been broken and shield us from the enemy. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever seen a very well done friends when you entered a compound with a good fence and a good gate? Did you feel safe? One of the very important things in building is to secure a good fence that will offer protection for your household. Fences not only make houses look neat and cute, but they also mark definite boundaries. They also keep unwanted intruders out of the place. It can be very comforting to know that you have a fence that will keep Wandering animals from outside, not getting into your compound, that will keep your children inside the compound. Well, some people decide when they have finished their fencing to secure their property, they say, no trespass. Some, after putting this sign, they can actually arrest you if you get into areas that you're not supposed to get into. You know, and yet some people still, when they see this sign of trespass, they just feel like now that's the time to trespass, either for fun or to plunder. But some people, they look out for broken walls where they, as they, they, they seem like nobody is attending to the property and they just want to break in to trespass because nobody sees them. But people believe that private possession, which are cared for, are actually fenced and they will have walls. That's why today we are talking about rebuilding walls. This was the case in Nehemiah's day when the walls were broken. The walls surrounding the city were broken. Nehemiah was a worker in the palace at Shushan during the reign of King Ataxas. Eh, that's a hard name. Atax. You go and read it, Ataxaxis. Yeah, I got it. Ataxaxis Longimanus, that was his name. And he was the cup bearer. Yet he did not know what to do about the broken walls. But how did he go about it? First of all, we see him in making an inquiry. We read in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 2, Nehemiah says, I asked concerning the Jews which had escaped, which, left off the, which, which were left of the captivity, and he also asked concerning Jerusalem. You know, friends, the first step to rebuilding walls is to show concern. To show concern. Nehemiah asked concerning the Jews. He was concerned about people. He was concerned about the temple. Notice the Bible says, I asked concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of captivity. My question today, today is, what concerns you? People are concerned about many things. In fact, I can tell you today, the world is concerned about virus. Some people are concerned about money. Some are concerned about their jobs. Some are concerned about deals and tenders. Others yet are concerned about their houses, their cars, their children, their sweethearts, or their next date. What keeps you awake at midnight? You know, Nicodemus, the Bible says, at midnight in John, in John chapter 3, verse 5, he came to Jesus and his chief concern was one. How shall one get into the kingdom of God? And Jesus answering him, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the question is, what concerns you? What was concerning Je uh, Nehemiah was Jerusalem, was God's city, was God's house. Is anybody concerned about the church during this hard time? There are people who, when they have missed church service, they are not concerned. But when they have missed a, ba a basketball game, they are so concerned, they want to find out what was the score. 
Well, some people miss because of excuses. They say, oh, I live very far away. They can't go to church. They can't log on because they have bundles and they have good excuses. But the question is, are the things of God of importance to you? Do you put priority in asking or you say, ah, those are little things. But in a good man's life, like Nehemiah, even little things are important. No wonder Zechariah asks in Zechariah 4 verse 10, Who has despised the days of little things? Who has despised the days of little things? Some people think the matters of spiritual warfare are little. But Nehemiah was concerned. Let's see how he shows his concern. Number one, he makes an inquiry. He makes an inquiry. He asks questions. You know, today we live in houses where people don't ask any question. Fathers are not concerned. They are quiet like King David. We read that earlier. And Jacob. And walls here represent the women and sons and our houses. When things are broken, do we raise an inquiry? Do we ask about their situation? You know, I found an interesting quotation in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, in page 578. I would like to read it to you who are in charge of homes, who are in charge of houses, who are in charge of the church. It says, those who have too little courage to remove wrong or who through indoors laziness or lack of interest, they make no effort to purify the family or the church of God. They are held accountable for the evil that might result from their neglect of injury and their neglect of duty. And it finishes by saying, we are just as responsible for the evils we might have checked in others by exercising of two things, parental or pastoral authority, as if as if those acts were our own. Friends, what is your concern? What are you in, inquiring about? People are today just concerned about virus. How many people have gotten it? What has the, 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 the government said? But are you also inquiring about spiritual things? You know, if you want to learn what a person really likes or what they are like or what is concerning them, ask them, Three questions. How many questions? Three. Ask them, what makes you to laugh? <laughs> ask them, what makes you angry? And ask them, what makes you weep? Nehemiah was zealous about the holy city, Jerusalem. And friends, when we are not yet in heaven, we should make inquiry of how we will be in heaven. And the second point, apart from inquiry, he empathized. The other day I said to empathize is to go down with the person, while to sympathize is to look down at the person. In empathizing, we read in Nehemiah 1.4, when I heard these words, Nehemiah says, I sat down. That means I went down. And I wept, and I mourned certain days, and I fasted. And the last thing there, I prayed to the God of heaven. I didn't ask the politicians. There are things that are beyond politicians, you know. When we see the content of his inquiry, then we see the response. His response is with weeping, with emotions, with tears, and he fasts. Today, people cry about different things. Politicians cry in our country I had. They were crying about, you know, the fallen hero. I had one of our politicians crying and saying, Joey. Joey actually is a, a buffalo. Teachers and students are crying when children die in school, when the dates of their graduation is postponed. The world leaders are crying for pandemics. Some tears could be genuine, others are crocodile. Other people are crying about climate, others about economy, others about corruption. Well, friends, some people are zealous about women's rights or money or politics or church money has been used strongly, church money has been used strongly, or positions. Friends, the question I ask for you, of you today, what causes you to cry?
The world itself is crying. And jo uh, David in Psalms, he says, I also waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined uh, and me and heard my cry. David the king was also crying. Let me tell you, the world has been crying. Romans chapter 8 verse 22 tells us the weight and the extent of the cry. It says, for we know that the whole creation, don't, it, it's not just crying, it groans and travails in pain together until now. We have heard the cry of all ages since the day of Adam. As they witnessed the drooping flower when they had sinned, the leaves started falling. And Adam and his companion Eve mourned more deeply than men today mourn their dead. And after the cry of Adam, we saw the cry of Abel's blood from the ground over injustice and unfairness that springs from quarrels and division between brothers. When envy and hatred and jealousy started rising around the concept of worship, when brother was rising against a brother, and friends, it is a short while when we will see this scene of Cain and Abel repeating itself. A brother rising against another because their language is different, their clan is different. We've seen tribal clashes. Then there is the cry and the pain of broken trust. When Simon Peter cried when he, 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 he betrayed innocent blood in Jesus. Not only that, we have seen parents, fathers and mothers, husbands and wives crying because they have been betrayed. Then came the cry of Esau for lost opportunity when he lost the blessings of being firstborn, of being progenitor of Christ. Yet the greatest blessing can, uh, we can cry for today is the fact that Jesus can forgive our sins, that he can be born in our hearts. And that's why we read in Acts chapter 3, verse 26, the, the Bible says, Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus Christ, he sent him to bless you, in turning every man, every one of you from his iniquity. You know, the greatest blessing we can have is to cry to God that he will forgive us our sins. And when he forgives our sins, he will heal our broken homes. He will heal our broken lives. He will heal our broken nation. Leah also cried for his children because he could not be comforted when King Herod was out there killing them. And Leah here represents mothers who are crying for their lost children. Mordecai cried for the reproach of Israel when uh, the king had passed a law that was contrary to the Jews. Nehemiah cried for the walls and he wanted to repair them. Friends, do we see around the children being killed in unwarranted stampede in schools? Do we see terrorism increasing and people dying out of no reason? And Psalms, in the book of Psalms, chapter 6, verse 6, David says, I am weary with the groaning, with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. That doesn't mean he's swimming in the bed. Uh, this is swimming in his tears. I water my couch with tears. Is there somebody today crying because he has lost opportunity of putting up an enterprise that would have saved the world during this time? Or an enterprise that would have secured his family safety. Some of us may know it could have been the best time to have gone out from the cities into the farmlands, into the country to start country living. Some people are going to cry for lost opportunity. But somebody would say, ah, Andrew, is that David who was crying? I am weary with tears and my groanings all the night. You know, that text looks like it's a lady who wrote it. Do men cry? That's the question. You've seen in most cultures, they say, boys don't cry. Boys don't cry. Men don't cry. But friends, I say, men today, the reason they don't cry, they are bottling the anger inside. 
They are angry inside and all the pent-up emotion in lost identity, in lost authority, in lost purpose, in lost fulfillment, you can see it being wasted. When bills and expenses and taxes and debt are pulling them down, you can see the men are angry and they are crying and the tears are going inside. When they are drowned in financial debt, they are crying and the tears are going inside. When they are stressed and depressed, you now know it were better they cried like the women do cry. You know a woman gets some small stress, runs to the neighbor, cries there, and comes out. A man is disillusioned in his work. Work is taking a toll on him. They grind blindly at, at the Philistines' mill, and they work and labor. It seems like he's crying only to his desk. And nobody knows that he's struggling. And, Gen and Exodus says that our God in heaven hears the groaning. The Bible says that when the, the Israelites cried to God, when the labor was too hard on them, when Pharaoh was too hard on them, God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham. Let me tell you out there, are you struggling with a difficult circumstance, a difficult economic situation? God is looking upon and God will have respect on your tears and will have respect on your efforts. Men grown out of the city, Job says. Don't say men don't cry. Men grown from out of the city and the soul of the wounded cry out. Even Jesus himself, didn't he not weep? weep? Didn't he weep? When he saw Jerusalem was getting lost, he said in Luke 19, 41, when he came near to Jerusalem, he beheld the city, and what did he do? Read it out there. He wept over it. He said, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, that I would have gathered you as a hen gathers its cheeks. And on the cross, even before the cross, one day when people were crying over Lazarus, Jesus was also touched by the infirmity, by the grief, by death, which is the antithesis of life. When men are dying out of virus, God's heart is touched. The songwriter says, oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. He also went to the funeral and he cried. And when he came to the cross on Golgotha's mountain, he cried. Cried, it is finished. If you haven't heard the cry of the world, if you haven't heard the travail of a world that is ready to be ripped, these calamities by sea and by land should awake us to cry to our Lord and not sleep in the lower decks like Jonah. When this cry will be heard, the next time, Maybe you will be the one crying, and the cry won't be good. Oh, I pray that we will arise today and cry to our God, lest we cry, the summer is past, the harvest is past, and we are not saved. If you haven't heard the cry of the world, did you catch the cry of the three angels in glory in the, in the, in the air when they cried and said, Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship only him who made the heavens and the earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. Have you heard the angel who cried and said, Fallen is Babylon? Or did you hear the third angel saying, If anybody worships the beast and his mark, indeed we live in a time that is so close to those moments. Nehemiah cried. Not only did he inquire, not only did he empathize, but he prayed, friends. The Bible says in verse 4, Nehemiah chapter 1, when I heard these words, I sat down, I wept, I mourned certain days and fasted, and not only that, I prayed before the God of heaven. I prayed. You know, the cries in his prayer, he was asking of a blessing. He was asking to use the opportunity like Jabez. When Jabez cried in First Chronicles, he also made a prayer that I would like you to make. In this world today, First Chronicles chapter 4 verse 10, First Chronicles chapter 4 verse 10, the cry of Jabez. Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my or my bounds and that 
command be with me today we can make the same prayer that God will his hand will be with us and that he would keep us from evil and that we may not grieve how many of you out there need know that today in this world we need hearts that are large if our families have to go, you know, together, have to stay together, we need a large heart to withstand and accommodate the differences in our homes and in our churches. But let's look at Nehemiah's prayer in verse 5. He said, Lord, I beseech thee, O God of heaven, the great and terrible God, hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night. Let's start by showing you that this was a reverent prayer in its attitude. We see in verse 5, he recognizes this God as a great God. It's not just reverent prayer, it's a persistent prayer we read in verse 6. He prayed day and night. And then it is also a penitent prayer. Penitence means you repent of your sin. You turn or make a U-turn. If you are going this way, you turn. In verse 6 he says, we have sinned. We have dealt corruptly. We have not kept your commandment. This prayer also, friends, is a scriptural prayer. Verse 9. Verse 8, sorry, he reminds God his word. He says, I beseech thee the word that you commanded through your servant Moses. You know, some of us go to prayer and our prayers are just our own words and not God's words. Can you quote God's promises and tell him, God, you are the one who said that if you are people who are called by your name will bow down and humble themselves and repent, turn away from their sin, you will forgive their sin. You will heal their land. A scriptural prayer. And yet this prayer also is a childlike prayer. We read that in verse 10 and 11. He says, if you abide with me and my words, uh, that is, uh, sorry, in verse 10. Now these are your servants. These are your people. You are the one who has redeemed them. He is acting like a child, helpless before God. And yet this prayer is also definite in its aim because it has one objective. Let us learn to pray like Nehemiah, a prayer that is reverent, a prayer that is persistent, a prayer that is penitent, a prayer that is scriptural in its argument, a prayer that is childlike, a prayer that is definite in its aim. You know, friends, that is our mode for prayer today. Who of you would like to pray? Can you pray now when things go wrong at home? Can you pray now when things go wrong with the country? Can you pray when your finances and provisions go low? We all need divine interposition because this is the safest place. When Nehemiah was concerned, he prayed. If people are going to be concerned about this nation, they will pray. And the second point, Nehemiah makes sacrifices. We see in chapter 2, verse 11, Nehemiah came to Jerusalem. Well, for you to understand that that was a sacrifice, he was there three days. <laughs> Where was Nehemiah coming from? Nehemiah was coming from the courts of the king, a place where there is lavish, there is supply, there is a lot. There is a lot of sacrifice on Nehemiah's part when he left Shushan for Jerusalem, a place desolate. Nehemiah is the type of Christ who, even though he was rich, and he was dwelling in king's palace in glory. He decided, I'm going to leave all that. And he became poor so that he could reconstruct this broken world. He even risks Ataxaxi's irritation. He risks losing his privilege and his payment and his salary and the ease and provision and the favor of his big office. He says, I'm going to leave all the allowance and he takes a strenuous, toilsome journey, a journey of danger. Talk about one who exchanges royal robes with a soldier's armor. He is living peace and comfort. The things he knows. Friends, there is coming a time when some of you, having known the will of God, will live, diff will live usual known environments of employment and will go into difficult private uh, sessions and live in countries, in countryside, so to speak. 
Nehemiah leaves his peace and command to face hostility. He leaves Jerusalem for Shushan. What a sacrifice. And finally, friends, for him to be able to rebuild walls, he decides he is going to plan his work. He does not do it in guesswork. He does not just wake up and say, oh, me, I am going. I, am go I don't know where I will start. You know, life, friends, is full of surprises. And one of the greatest skills we can learn is our willingness to adjust. Right now, there are people who will hear their offices are closed forever because they are no longer transacting business. Maybe China no longer brings their business this side. And the ability to adjust, the ability to follow divine call without hesitation is an important one during this time. And so Nehemiah goes into prayer. And when you want to make an adjustment, make it from a point of prayer. When God has shown you what to do and you have planned it, so he prepares his mind and he also prepares the king. He does not just wake up and tell the king, me tomorrow I'm not coming to work. No, no, no. He actually tells the king, I am going to ask you for a leave. My leave begins on this day to this day. I will not be at work. Not only that, while Nehemiah was working, he was working hard. He is a trusted employee, and he knows how to speak with his seniors. And he has already gotten himself promotion, and now he needs to come and ask for the monarch to give him favor to go out. Look at how he begins. He starts at once with a plan. And he also manages. He knows how he's going to manage the changes. He knows how he's going to go through this. Verse 12, chapter 2. Nehemiah says, And I arose in the night. I and some men with me. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. You know, friends, like Abraham of old, there are times you need to wake up at night and take the journey to Moriah and take the sacrifice, not telling too many people because they'll discourage you. So Nehemiah did surveys. He rose up at night and he wanted to see what is available where. What do I have? Night moments of prayer. Friends, if we have to rebuild walls, we have to wake up by night and follow God's call at once. You know, somebody said, never mind the condition of the walls in Jerusalem. You care that the, the souls are okay. But I ask you, that is not true because the condition of the walls is sometimes a good index of the condition of the soul. When you see the walls are broken down, you can be sure that the soul is also wandering in darkness. Things external often stand in subtle relation to things spiritual. When you see a young man, he's no longer careful about how he looks. And he's maybe gone after fashion. And that is what takes all his attention. You can be sure that the soul is almost being corrupted. But the question is, I would like to finish with today. What are these broken walls of Jerusalem? I'd like to tell you this truth is, and I answer from the Bible, the broken walls of Jerusalem is found in chapter 144 of Psalms, verse 12. Psalms 144, verse 12. The Bible that our sons and daughters, that they should be cornerstones, polished after the similitude of a palace. But you know, friends, most of our homes, most of our sons and daughters are broken. And yet, the greatest enterprise we can therefore take is to build the tower of God's family. The greatest building we can ever erect is to build the body of Christ. And so today, I'd like to suggest to you that there are many broken vessels around you. Not just walls, 
vessels are also broken. The foundations are already broken. They are destroyed. And the question is, what can the righteous do? Walls, I've told you, are broken. Boundaries are broken of sacred purity. And family circles are broken. Broken by what? By social media. We have shared with you how David was on his Facebook wall and he was out there looking at Bathsheba who had just gone to swim and posted her photo on the, you know, on, 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 on her page. And today, the boundaries of family reserve have been broken by internet. Not only that, trust has been broken by betrayal and by secrecy. Communication in homes have been broken and people can't talk in homes. Not only that, friends, visions have been broken down like Joseph's vision. The question is, what causes brokenness? And I have four reasons. I would like you to take note of these four reasons. What causes brokenness of anything? Number one, natural aging. When a pot is old, it just breaks down. Things that are old, walls that are old, breaks down. The second reason why things break down is neglect. Neglect. Just neglect your family. Neglect um, your home and it will break down. The other one is invasion. Invasion of uh, enemies from outside. Invasion from, uh, f uh, you know, the enemy, the, the devil himself. And then the other thing that can cause brokenness is carelessness. But maybe you ask me, how do you know that somebody is broken? Is there something broken in our home? Is there something broken in my wife's life, in my children's life? Here are some signs that you can use to know if someone is broken. One of them is fear, insecurity, pessimism, avoidance. Like the Samaritan woman was a broken woman. Jesus was telling her, can you go and call your husband? The woman said, ah, you know you Jews, you worship on the mountain. No, the conversation was not about mountain. The conversation was about brokenness. And the woman was just an escapist. And some people are too busy to come to their homes, too busy to worship, too busy to take the Bible and read for their children. That can be a sign of brokenness. Another sign of brokenness is avoidance. Another one is sadness and grief. And other people are just rough and insensitive. That might be a sign of brokenness. But friends, I have one more point before I close this broadcast. This is the point I want you to take home. God loves broken things. God loves broken things. The of a cathedral church that was the disaster destroyed the church, and all that remained was a century-old statue of Jesus. Of course, I'm not saying you go and erect statues in your church because the Bible com forbids erecting statues even of Jesus Himself. That's the first and second and third commandment, and not to worship them. But there's some lesson here. Only the arms, you know, the arms of Jesus was, that was stretched out was left. The statue was broken, but the arms of Jesus was left outstretched. And then another earthquake came. And they said, let's fix this statue. Well, they fixed the other parts and it was now that hand that was left was the one that was injured and broken by the second earthquake. This time the church board said, we are not fixing that hand. They had made arrangements to fix it, but they said, no, 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 we are not fixing that hand. And when a man asked, why are you not fixing the statue of Jesus when the hand is so important that it was broken, he said, well, that broken hand will serve as a reminder of that the, to the entire body that the hand of Jesus was broken and his feet was broken so that he could repair us broken human beings. Friends, it is okay to be broken. I am not passing condemnation because God works with broken things. God uses broken things. It takes a broken soil to produce crop. It takes broken clouds to produce rain. It takes a broken seed to give bread. It takes broken bread to give strength. God loves brokenness. It took 
the breaking of the alabaster box to give forth fresh perfume to anoint Jesus. Is there a part in your life that is broken? Is your finance broken? Is your spiritual life, your career broken? Is your family life broken? God loves broken things. The last story I'll finish with today was about a tour bus. It was journeying through Israel with a group of Americans when they saw a unique sign. An Israeli shepherd was carrying a lamb in his arms. And they wondered, why is the shepherd carrying a lamb in his arms? The bus stopped to talk with the shepherd and to give the tourists a chance of interview to take pictures. And the little boy asked the shepherd, why are you carrying that little lamb in your arms? Can't it walk by itself? The shepherd smiled and looked at the little boy tourist and said, you don't understand. This sheep is broken. Whenever we are broken, friends, God bears us in his arms. Somebody said, my tears of, of weeping are pleasing to the Lord. So cry to the Lord. My cries of emptiness are a song to his ears. He is pleased with me when I am broken because what he desires most of men is a broken spirit and a contrite heart he will not despise. Is there anybody who is broken this time? Well, friends, one day a man, as he was rebuilding walls, they were using a ladder and they went to the fourth floor with the ladder. And soon as the man was fixing the wall on fourth floor, the ladder soon just broke and the man was coming down to fall and you could tell from the floor where he was falling, this man was going to die. And he made his prayer through the fourth floor when he was just about, and it was not a dream by the way, it was true. He was just about to land on his spine when he hit a large, big, uh, sheep, sheep of S H E P, the animal. The sheep was fat and the sheep had a lot of wool. Well, as the story has it, the sheep actually broke down and was broken in pieces, but the man was cushioned from the impact and he didn't die. You know, friends. Even though we think we are the ones who are broken by sin, by difficulty, Jesus, the Lamb of God, was broken and he is the one who takes away the sin of the world. And we can turn to him. When we are building and uh, rebuilding our houses and our walls, maybe we might slip and fall. Or oh, that we might fall on the sheep. That when the sheep is broken... The man looked at the sheep. The sheep died actually on his behalf. And this is what Jesus did for us. This song we are going to close with asks you to consider Jesus. Oh, what a savior he is. His hand was broken. His side was pierced. And friends, won't you give your life to him? Are you any broken? Can we ask this sheep? Can we ask the Lamb of God to take away our sin? This song says, Oh, what a Savior. Listen to this song. Oh, what a Savior. I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within 
Chilling waters I'll soon be crossing His hand will lead me Safely o'er I'll join that chorus in that bright mansion I'll sing with him forever more Oh, what a Savior Oh, hallelujah to give your life to him today do you feel somewhere broken can we ask for his help as we close this broadcast let me invite you for a word of prayer as we close dear heavenly father we thank you because our names are engraven in the palm of your hands that is permanence you can't forget about us when we are broken you love us the most we ask, Lord, that today you will stretch forth your hand of purpose to touch us, to lift us from our pits of despondency. And Lord, we pray that you will touch every brokenness around our life, that you will make us whole again. We ask this in Jesus' name. 